And ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Uh, let me be the first to apologize for the traffic uh, getting here uh, and for the metro blockages as well. Uh, we didn't know when we were scheduling this we had the national Christmas tree to compete with. Um, but uh, I'm glad that you made it here, and I think we have a terrific evening planned for you. My name is Kurt Volker. I have the honor of being the executive director of the McCain Institute for International Leadership, which was formed to honor the legacy of service to our country of Senator and Mrs. McCain and the McCain family going back generations. It's part of Arizona State University, uh, but based here in Washington and in D.C. Uh, it is dedicated to advancing character-driven leadership and to being a do tank more than a think tank, a do tank where we try to take on projects in the areas of humanitarian work, human rights, rule of law, governance, and security. And one of the things that we do is we organize this debate series in order to tee up and consider some of the key challenges facing our country and, in fact, facing the world. Uh, I can't even count how many of these we've done now, but we've asked questions such as, should the United States intervene in Syria? As early as January 13, we held that debate. Uh, we've talked about whether we should get out of Afghanistan, how to deal with Iran, is it time for containment with Russia? And this evening's debate is on a topic very dear to my heart, which is, is it uh, time uh, for the United States to pivot back to Europe? Uh, there's obviously a lot going on in Europe, and we have a great moderator who's going to tee that up and some great debaters here. Uh, let me introduce all of them, uh, because normally we let our moderator do this, but since they're all old friends of mine, I, I just thought I would say a few words about each. Uh, starting immediately to my left here is Ian Brzezinski. Ian is a uh, former Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense. He's a senior advisor at the Atlantic Council. I knew him when he served on the Foreign Relations Committee staff, and we worked together uh, in the administration when I was at State and he was at the Pentagon. Um, we have Constanze Stelzenmüller, who is a visiting scholar here. She's had many hats in her life, including with the German Marshall Fund in uh, Berlin and is now with the Brookings Institution here in Washington. And one of her recent triumphs is being inducted to the Swedish Academy, so we're very uh, pleased to have her here. Swedish Academy of Sciences as a foreign affairs or national War security War fellow. Sciences. Very good, thank you. Uh, we have Patrick Cronin, who is with the Center for New American Security and leads the Asia Pacific Security Program. Uh, also with a uh, great background at USAID uh, in the U.S. Senate. I believe also at National Defense University, if, I don't, uh, uh, if I'm not mistaken. And finally, Niall Gardner. Uh, Niall, who um, is at the Heritage Institution and runs the Margaret Thatcher Center for Freedom. And Niall has been a fixture in Washington for about a decade now uh, as an advocate for U.S.-U.K. relations and also a gadfly on anything dealing with U.S.-E.U. relations. Um, we are very pleased tonight that uh, this debate is, um, has been supported by the, US delega the EU delegation to the United States and the European Union, so we're grateful for that, and we hope we have some members here from there. And I, we do encourage you to take this as an active participating role for yourselves. So put your cell phones on silent, but don't turn them off. Feel free to tweet and comment during the course of the debate, hashtag MIDebate. Uh, we uh, also encourage you to ask questions. There will be an opportunity for the audience to do that. Uh, as far as the structure of this, it is a timed, structured debate. We try to keep it fair for both sides, but we also want it to be lively. Uh, the question, again, is should the U.S. pivot back to Europe? And we have Ian and Costanza arguing that we should, and Patrick and Niall arguing a dose of skepticism on all of that. And in order to run this debate, uh, we are very honored and delighted to have with us Terry Schultz. Uh, if you get up in the morning and listen to the radio and you get all the bad news from Brussels about the Eurozone or about NATO or about the uh, terrorist shutdown of Brussels, uh, the voice you hear is that of Terry Schultz, who's the NPR correspondent uh, reporting out of Brussels. And without any further ado, let me turn it over to Terry to get us going in our debate. Thank you very much for being here. Thanks. Kurt, I am very privileged to be here, even though when he gave me the dates, I said, Kurt, I can't miss the second day of the NATO foreign ministerial. I was very upset about that, but I think he probably saved me. Um, it was what? What do you think is going to happen? Montenegro. God. Um, so the last time that Kurt and I were on a, a panel, <laughs> it had huge headlines. Um, 
The last time Kurt and I were on a panel, it was in Estonia a couple of years ago, three years, two years ago, and the title of that panel was um, The Pivot to Asia. Was it really happening? Should it happen? And should the Europeans be worried or insulted or, as Kurt suggested from his days in the administration, relieved? Uh, since then, <laughs> since then uh, the relationship has indeed been strained by many things. Um, the NSA's so-called spying scandal, although I will say that some Europeans, including the president of the European Parliament at the time, expressed his delight that they were uh, that the NSA was apparently spying on them because it thought that it meant that the U.S. actually thought the European Parliament was interesting. I'm not <laughs> kidding. That is not a joke. I'm not kidding. Direct quote in an interview. He was really tickled. Um, but there, there, the strains were there, sort of the, the lack of trust issue, um, the ongoing permanent reluctance of NATO allies to pay their share of mutual defense. Ian will talk about that to some extent. Um, there are now more divisions about how Europe should handle its refugee and migration crisis, what the U.S. should do to help, if the U.S. should do more to help. There are differences over responses to terrorism, which now which threaten Europe and now increasingly threaten the U.S. Um, again, t been being taken out by Kurt of the apparent jihadi hotbed of Brussels. Um, I should be grateful that I'm a few days out of lockdown. Um, so the, the question, uh, as, as I was coming here, people were asking if I'd read the Ann Applebaum article um, titled, Does Europe Even Matter? Question mark. And the, the, the next line is, Dysfunction has sucked Brussels dry of any foreign policy power or relevance, period. So it wasn't really a question for her in that article. Um, I'm sure many of you have read it. Uh, even some committed European Union supporters fear that the bloc is currently so strained that it's falling apart. And many Europeans want to pivot away from Europe themselves. Niall. Uh, not, not, only, not only the Brits, though. I mean, the Hungarians, um, to some extent the Slovenians. Um, Europeans, many Europeans are very disillusioned with, with their union. On the other hand, who is Washington really going to call when it needs help, if not Europe? Even if you do need a dozen numbers now. And nobody knows anyone's name. So we, we are going to start off now with... Four minutes for each side, four minutes from the pro-pivot, four minutes from the anti-pivot, and um, then they will have rebuttals to their opening arguments, and then we will move to questions. And because I appreciate everyone being here, um, especially some of my friends who came, um, um, I'm going to open it to the audience earlier than they sometimes do in this debate to get your questions, and um, if I don't get my questions answered that way, I'll go ahead and, and throw them back to the audience. So I'm very happy to be here, and I really thanks Kurt for having me. And let us start with Ian and Constanza. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Uh, you know, when I think of, of Europe, I think of primarily in security terms. So I'm a little less worried about what the EU is doing, and I'm more worried about what national government's doing or what NATO is doing. And when I look back at the history of the transatlantic relationship, when I think of the Cold War, I remember at times when we had, the United States had 300,000 troops deployed permanently, stationed in, in Europe. Of course, the Cold War ended, and about a decade later, at the turn of the century, we had about 100,000 troops. And then from last, over the last decade, that number has dropped down to about 60,000. That drop from 100,000 to 60,000, <coughs> that's the pivot that I've seen in, in U.S. policy, a pivot away from Europe. And it was a pivot that was undertaken by two administrations, a Republican administration and the current Democratic administration. And it was a bipartisan mistake. We should pivot back. Why? Because we have a world today that is more dangerous and more complex. It features revanchist regimes, ideological extremism, failed states. And the United States needs allies and partners that have a combination of economic resources, military capability, and political legitimacy. And Europe offers the best combination, a better combination than I would say anywhere else in the world. The EU is an $18 trillion economy. Europe offers, through NATO, unmatched military capability on global terms. NATO is the world's most integrated and effective and combat-tested multinational force. And we should never forget European contributions and sacrifices to U.S.-led operations in Iraq and Afghanistan. And then, of course, the transatlantic community constitutes a unique collection of like-minded democracies that have a proven record of collective action. 
And on top of those assets, we have a reality that Europe is now, once again, a stage for confrontation between the West and Russia. And that co confrontation features very dangerous escalatory dynamics. We should be concerned, we should be proactive, we should be engaged. And I'd say some of the vulnerabilities that we have in that confrontation are rooted in the United States' pivot away from Europe. Europe has its faults. It's got its free riders. Some countries have very low defense spending. That is true. But it provides no better set of allies with which to deal with, with which to collectively promote freedom and security. But to leverage this potential, the United States has to invest in this relationship. It can't lead from behind. It has to lead at the helm, from the helm of the transatlantic community. That's why I think we ought to pivot back. All right. <clears throat> now, um, to those of you who don't know me, um, I am something of a liberal hawk, um, which puts me in a somewhat smaller group uh, in my own country, although you would probably be surprised by how many there are of us. Um, and I'm roughly of the same age as the policymakers now running my own country. And uh, perhaps you might want to remember that we were young people, students during the Cold War, and we have well-trained Cold War reflexes, and it hasn't been very difficult uh, to remember those in the current circumstances. Uh, I think that it's sometimes forgotten in this town, at least by people who aren't in the machine room currently working with people in Berlin and other um, European capitals. Um, and that is also why I think there hasn't really been that much of a pivot away, as is often said, particularly by conservative critics of this administration. From what I can see, and I have been a a here for a year now in a three-year gig at Brookings, and I've been back 14 times. I go to Berlin and other European capitals regularly, uh, from <coughs> Athens to, to Riga and, and, and Tallinn and Stockholm and Paris and so on. And my sense is that cooperation between the White House, the State Department, DOD, and their counterparts in European capitals has been intense, has been constructive, has been cooperative. The, there have been disagreements, of course, um, and there have been failures. But the disagreements, I think, have been legitimate disagreements about very often technical issues or timing, timing of sanctions, rather than about ideological questions. I think we are in broad agreement about the dangers presented by Vladimir Putin's Russia, by the chaos in the Middle East and what that means for European stability, and in very broad agreement about the need to work together as Americans and Europeans. The problems, the vulnerabilities that we have, I think are not so much because of, the, uh, because of a supposed U US pivot away, but because globalization, which has enriched us and made our continent more peaceful, peaceful, has also made us more vulnerable and weakened our nation states. And for many Europeans, including many Germans and including me, Europe and the European Union is a way to leverage um, the power that we have to work together to decrease our vulnerabilities and increase our strength, particularly at a time when we have in our defense budgets, which are lamentably <laughs> low, but are being increased, including in my country, have reached a point where technology costs are such, and the technology and the complexity of technology are such, that defense budget increase, uh, increases alone are not going to resolve the problem. <coughs> and let me leave you with one final thought. I welcome American engagement in Europe. What I don't want to see again is the infantilizing codependency marked by resentment on both sides uh, that we had at some times in the, during the Cold War, if we're honest with each other. What I want is a Europe that is more responsible, that steps up to the plate, that takes on more of its burden, and that works with America when it needs to, and relieves it of the burden when America has pressing preoccupations elsewhere. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, Terry and Kurt, thank you very much, and I apologize to the audience uh, for my hoarse uh, throat. My argument is somewhat nuanced because I'm sympathetic to the proposition, but my position is that the rebalance to Asia in no way and should not detract from the longstanding transatlantic alliance and relations. Um, the United States, in fact, should be in lockstep with our European allies to counter revisionist great powers, whether they're aggressive and declining like Russia or simply coercive and rising like China. We should also fully tap the transatlantic alliance to develop a strategy to deal with transnational terrorism and institutions or entities like this so-called Islamic State. Fortunately, we have highly developed, integrated, 
and as Ian pointed out, very capable institutions like NATO. They already exist, um, and we can and should be using them fully. The United States remains, after all, a global power. Even the rebalance to Asia was never meant to say that we didn't have interests on the Eurasia rimland from Europe to the Middle East to the Indo-Pacific, just the opposite. The rebalance to Asia, as announced by the Obama administration in 2011, was really a conflation of two things. Um, on the one hand, the long-term trends that many administrations had seen happening over decades, that is the shift in global power, especially economic power, from west to east, but also the short-term desire of the administration politically to draw away from two hot wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. I think you can argue that they did it too fast and too much, but that's not the pivot to Asia. That was a separate policy decision on the part of the administration. So don't, don't confuse it with the strategy of a long-term reorientation toward the gradual uh, economic integration with a rising Indo-Pacific region, with a closer political integration, and with dealing with the military challenges and opportunities posed by, by the region. Um, strengthening allies applies in Asia just as it does in, in Europe. So the idea of this argument, of this proposition, misrepresents the U.S. balance uh, policy to Asia. And I think this rebalance adjusts our comprehensive engagement to correspond with a shift in the diffusion of power makes a lot of sense. This is half the world's population, a third of the global GDP and rising. Some of the most capable and most modernizing militaries are in the Asia Pacific. This is the center of gravity now, and it's even becoming more so as you head out to the middle of the century. So let's do more with European allies but let's not besmirch arguably the most strategic element of the administration's foreign policy by blaming it all, all of Europe's current ills on it. Thank you. Okay, shake it up, Niall. <laughs> <laughs> way, way, too, way too much solidarity in the court here. Uh, well, firstly, thanks very much for the invitation. It's a great honor to be here to speak to the McCain Institute. And, and John McCain uh, is a tremendous patriot and a, and a true war hero, and we owe him an immense uh, debt of gratitude. Um, I, I note that the EU is helping to fund this, this debate. They might want to refund after listening to my comments here. <laughs> yeah. um, One quarter of it. <laughs> I, would, I would say you know, that um, you know, we should be suspicious of the term pivot, really. And administrations use the word pivot uh, in order to disguise, really, a lack of strategy and a lack of policy and a lack of attention paid to uh, certain areas of the world. So you can expect the White House to shortly announce a, a pivot to Syria, for example, to cover for the fact they don't actually have a Syria strategy. Um, so when I heard uh, the, the term pivot to Europe, I immediately had a, a, a very negative reaction to that. We don't need the United States to pivot back to Europe. We need America to rebuild key partnerships with important allies across the Atlantic. That includes Great Britain, Poland, uh, key nations in Eastern and Central Europe, for example. Uh, who have been treated in some cases with, with disdain by the current administration. We need the United States to be far more assertive in standing up to the Russian bear uh, in Europe. And we also need America to reverse the, the very dangerous uh, series of base closings across uh, Europe, sending completely the wrong signal uh, at, at this time. We need to move beyond the idea that Europe is some sort of unified, uh, united uh, entity. Uh, and I believe firmly that um, you know, we should not be elevating the European Union, uh, which is uh, an organization that is, or an entity that is fundamentally undemocratic in my view. Uh, and there is a major push across Europe against the EU. There is a drive towards self-determination. We're seeing that in Great Britain uh, with the forthcoming EU referendum. The latest opinion poll shows, shows that a majority of British people would vote to leave the EU if that vote was held uh, today. And so Europe is a collection of nation states. Uh, Europe is not the United States of America, and we should not treat it as such. Uh, and uh, Angela Merkel actually you know, recently uh, declared that we should invest in the Schengen Agreement as the heart of the European project. And I'm sure that many people thought the Titanic was an extremely good investment back in 1911. But that's how we should be viewing the European Union today. It is like the Titanic. Fortunately, a few lifeboats uh, are about to be thrown off the boat. Uh, and many countries, I think, will begin to leave the EU if Britain decides to leave uh, the European Union. But to conclude, you know, the European project is a disaster. Margaret Thatcher, my former boss, described the EU as perhaps the, or the idea of the European project as the greatest folly of the modern era, she said, and how, how right she is. Uh, let's uh, advance real US leadership on the world stage, 
not, not gimmicks like having a, a pivot to Europe, for example. Uh, let's work with our allies. Let's strengthen American leadership. Let's lead from the front rather than from uh, behind. But let's, uh, let's end this, uh, this obsession in the State Department with you know, advancing this idea of some sort of European super state. Uh, the EU, it has to be said, is a, is a basket case. Let's not try and, and rescue a, a complete and utter uh, basket case. And let's, let's move forward, actually, and let's support self-determination, freedom, and sovereignty in Europe. Thank you. Okay, we've gone over time on everybody's speeches so far. I've got to get stricter. Um, each side will now have two minutes to give uh, a rebuttal to the opening remarks. So um, you can split it one and one, or one person can speak for two minutes. But let's, there's the clock up there. You guys can see it, too. A couple of points. Well, I don't know. I have a photograph on my iPhone, which sadly I don't have with me, of Margaret Thatcher in a very fetching jumper um, with all the EU flags on it, campaigning for the in-vote in 1973. So perhaps she changed her mind after that. Um, but it's an adorable picture, and I can, I can tweet it right after this again. I've tweeted it before. Um, look, I, I think that... It's, the EU certainly has a, a lot of problems, populism, um, the refugee crisis, the Eurozone crisis. Uh, I mean, those are all very real. Yeah. And it's anybody's guess, you know, how well we're going to deal with those. And it is entirely possible that Great Britain will leave the EU. But I think that would, that would be lamentable. It would be disaster, not just for Europe, but it would be disaster for Great Britain. Because I believe firmly, as firmly as Niall does his beliefs, that, that, uh, the, EU, that the UK has very successfully leveraged itself um, through the European Union and has very successfully... Uh, influence the EU, and when it is outside of the EU, will no longer be able to do that, and we'll find that that reduces its scope considerably. And I don't think that um, schmoozing with China behind the bleachers um, is going to um, is is a, a very seductive alternative, frankly. Uh, I also think, and, and I think now you know this, that it's not just this administration telling the Brits to please, please not go this route, but many Republicans as well. Um, so I would also say that, um, and again, I mean, to somebody who is a committed opponent of the project, I'm not, I don't expect to convince you, but um, I think that the EU richly deserved its Nobel Peace Prize for the peace that it brought to Europe, for the prosperity that it brought to Europe, and for the way that it helped the post-communist new members transform into functioning democracies after 1989. Okay, so that is a remarkable achievement. There have been enough sharp intakes of breath on the other side. I think Niall's ready yeah, to go. If, if I could, uh, could respond uh, <laughs> to those points. Okay. Uh, firstly... Two um, minutes now, please. Yeah. Does the EU deserve the Nobel Peace Prize? <laughs> uh, obviously not. Uh, and, uh, you know, let's, let's not forget who defeated the Soviet Empire. It was the United States, Great Britain. It was the leadership of Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher. It wasn't the European Union that defeated that, that monstrosity. Um, and uh, you, you referenced here uh, Margaret Thatcher and her very colourful jumper. Well, I worked for Margaret Thatcher for several, several <laughs> years, and, and I know exactly what she thought about uh, the European Union. Uh, and her views dramatically changed with regard to the EU in the 1980s. And it was her view, very firmly, that Britain needs, needed to get out of the European Union to reassert its sovereignty, to reassert itself as a free nation state. And that was Margaret Thatcher's uh, position. Um, and with regard, you mentioned uh, an important point there about uh, you know, U.S. administrations backing European integration. And, and that, that, is, that is a fair point. And many administrations have done that over many decades. But you argued that the Republicans support um, Britain staying in the European Union or have adopted the same line as the Obama administration. And, and let's be clear, clear here. President Obama has been lecturing the British people on how to vote in their own referendum. That, I think, is an appalling... Uh, intervention in British internal affairs. It's none of his business, actually. Uh, and when Republican presidential candidates have been asked about this issue, or the British referendum, they have very uh, clearly pointed out this is a matter for the British people to decide. But as uh, Jeb Bush, Ted Cruz, Marco Rubio have pointed out, they would quite happily sign on to a, a US-UK free trade agreement if the British people decide to reassert their sovereignty and leave the European Union and leave those shackles behind. And let's hope they do. But, but let's set the record straight, I think, on the Republican side. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to move on um, to the pivot to Syria, as if there were one. 
Um, it's a developing story now, and as a news person, I'm trying to keep track of this, that the shooters in San Bernardino um, likely had, I think was the last wording I saw, likely had a terrorist link. We're talking to handlers, um, I, I think un unknown, but people who were on watch lists of various governments, including the United States. Um, and even after Paris, there is still no appetite in the Obama administration or in any other, uh, in any European government for, for ground troops, unless everybody agrees on this, unless there's somebody else's ground troops. Um, and the president has just doubled the number of special forces he's deploying, I think from 50 to 100. So major contribution there. And when, Par when Paris looked at what its options were to ask for help, and Ian, I'm going to send this to you first. Uh, it decided not to go with Article 5 of NATO, though there were calls for it to do so. There were calls for it to ask its European allies to militarily support in a stronger way than it eventually, the decision it eventually took to use the EU treaty in this 42.7 previously unused clause, which simply obligates other EU members to do whatever they can to help France with either homeland defense or its external affairs. Do you think that the threat from ISIS should rise to the level of an Article 5 in NATO? Do you think that would then draw in the United States, would make European governments really start thinking hard about whether there is a military response other than more airstrikes to defeating ISIS? Well, as horrible as the, the strikes in, 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 in France were, I'm not sure they quite uh, ro rose the level of an Article 5. But you saw those calls. That there, were, there were plenty of people uh, well, then there should have been there should have been calls in support of Turkey when Turkey had 100 people blown up one day, uh, that, would, uh, that would justify an Article 5. You know, when you call for Article 5, you have to have uh, a clear sense of purpose of what you're going to do. And I don't think we have a clear sense of purpose in the alliance over what, what to do. So before you draw NATO in, you better have a very clear set of objectives and a strong consensus behind that. Now, as to what should be done is, is, is a different question. Uh, should we have safe zones? Should we have ground forces? Should we have uh, no-fly zones and that sort of thing? There's a whole different set of, uh, set of variables, and they're complex. I think you can do a lot to be effective against ISIS w without NATO. Uh, I think you can do a lot with a, a robust coalition of willing. And this is not so much a test of NATO as it is a test of transatlantic will. And that's where it comes down to. Do the Europeans have the stomach to do what's necessary to address a very complex, long-term challenge south of, of an allies border. And I don't think we're ever going to get that, the answer that we want, unless the United States demonstrates it's willing to take on the, the challenges and the responsibilities and the burdens that come with this task. In what way? Well, I mean, if they call airstrikes taking them on. Now you, well, I, I just don't think it's, it's going to be sufficient. I mean, if you're going to really address the problem, um, south of, of, uh, of, of Turkey, you're going to have to have a more robust ground presence than 50 special operators. It's 100 now. Uh, 100 operators. Uh, you're going to have to have much more uh, aggressive air, air strikes. You're going to have to have a much more robust presence simply, simply to contain the new dynamic that Russia has, 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 has entrance to that. But the fact of the matter, when you talk about this as a Europe issue or a U.S. issue, it's first and foremost a U.S. issue because we have to lead we, have, we can only lead if we demonstrate the necessary commitment, and that means putting in the forces necessary to do the job. Only then can we return to the Europeans and ask them to do more. Interesting. Um, would the anti-pivot side say the same, that the U.S. absolutely must lead on Syria and cannot leave it to the Europeans? Uh, even after Paris, one might think that France would want to take more of a lead, push the United States to, to do more. Well, I, mean, I, I agree that the United States um, has to lead on Syria and at the moment there is no real leadership coming from uh, Washington actually uh, and, and that I think is sending the wrong signal uh, across, the, uh, across the Atlantic. On the issue of uh, you know, how European countries should respond, it's very clear that the European Union itself is not really capable of doing anything. The European Union I think is a, is a complete side, side show or side player with regard to the Syrian uh, situation, and it's down to the individual nation states to act. Um, it was a very welcome development yesterday that uh, the British Parliament voted in favour of airstrikes against ISIS in Syria. Uh, that, I think, is a, is a very important uh, signal to be, to be sending. And, of course, France has already uh, taken part in airstrikes in Iraq and Syria, and hopefully more European countries will, will do so. But we do need an overall uh, strategy coming from uh, the United States and key European allies to, to defeat 
ISIS emphatically. Airstrikes alone simply will not do, do that. But if anyone is looking to Brussels to lead with regard to what is a global war against Islamist <coughs> terrorism, I think they will be sorely disappointed. But there are two, two headquarters in Brussels, both the European yes. Union and NATO. And yeah, we should so point I'm, that I was out. referring, of course, to the, to the EU. I mean, NATO... And uh, to be fair, not to be a, an EU defender, but yeah. uh, they don't have a military, and so you can't look to Brussels and the yeah. European yeah. Union for and, any and, kind of military and, uh, response. That, that's a very good thing. Uh, I don't think you want to have the European Union with some sort of... <laughs> no, you can't have it some both sort ways. Of, no, you can't no, you, say you, you that you want, shouldn't do this and then blame them for not no, doing you don't, it. No, you don't want a European Union having an army just taking resources away from NATO. And this is an important debate that's taking well, place And it's the British Europe. position that, that, yeah. that has prevented it's, any sort of further yeah, deepening. It's not of just any the, the British e position. Yeah. And it's nobody a position wants of, a European army. It's position of many, many European governments. <laughs> and with very good reason, because if there was a European Union army, I mean, who would be fighting in it? It would be overwhelmingly the British and the French. <laughs> Leave that to the nation states, not to some supranational entity. Well, this, as it is this, now. Is not, this is not a NATO versus EU right. issue. Right. Yeah. I mean, this is an issue of leveraging. Yeah. U.S. and European military firepower, European resources when it comes down to development and reconstruction, and that's where I think the EU can actually play a very useful role, and ultimately the political will national governments are going to have to make to make both of those contributions occur. Come and and Constanza, if you could yeah. add, what could possibly make any government do anything? Obviously, I mean, there are not sure. enough people dead in Paris yet. I, mean, what, what I, you know, I, I think that, that that's a line of argument that I wouldn't want to take. Um, I, I, I agree with, with Ian uh, that there are perfectly complementary roles for nation states, the EU as EU and NATO here. And we shouldn't, you know, because we're fighting a rearguard ideological action like Nile, uh, say, you know, that, 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 that we should leave one of those out of the equation. That's, that's just pointless because none of us have enough have enough, each of these uh, actors has important resources to bring to the table. Uh, the reality is that, Niall, I'm sorry, I really have to bang on about this, you're flogging a dead horse. Um, the, nobody in Europe is talking about a, uh, I, I don't know of a single European politician, except perhaps maybe some loony old French guys out there somewhere, um, who really want a European army, who you want, or who want a supranational EU for ideological reasons. The, the reason why some people are talking about deeper integration, including in defense and security, is for the simple reason that it, it appears very clear that, that we cannot always require the Americans to provide the defense and security backbone, backbone of what we do. Good example is the EU naval force under an EU flag in the Gulf of Aden, which has very effectively helped contain the threat of piracy from Somalia. I mean, this is not illegitimate, it's not anti-NATO, it's not anti-democratic, people want it, it's working, it's useful. So why be against that? I mean, I, it seems to me that that is, I mean, a pointless waste of energy, frankly. And so I, I, what we really need on, an, on, a, on a European level is counter-terrorism um, intelligence co cooperation. Yeah, that is not something that NATO provides a framework for. I frankly don't <laughs> care what the framework is as long as it gets done. Good enough. Patrick, you wanted to come in? Well, just Terry, back to your question on Syria. We don't really have a strategy for Syria, and this is the real deficit that we're lacking. It's even before you get to a deficit of capabilities, including European underinvestment in defense, including political will, a deficit of political will in Europe. Obviously, that's changed since Paris, perhaps, at least in some areas. But the United States and Europe, if they're going to do something effectively in the long term, as Ian points out, this is a long-term challenge, and it's more than the Islamic State, so-called. Um, this is going to take not just kinetic action, it's going to take a very long-term uh, sort of multi-level strategy. And if we're not able to come together with NATO allies and think through that strategy before we think through a U.S.-led military operation, then what is the good of NATO? I mean, NATO needs to help the United States also understand the right strategy to succeed. We're looking for strategic effect in the Middle East. And so far, the strategic effects have been working against Europe and the United States. Fairly enough. Um, I, now I want a double rebuttal. Well, just, just to respond to Constance's... Briefly, uh, very briefly. Uh, very briefly, because I think her, her argument that, you know, there are not uh, major forces in Europe put it, pushing for greater centralization of power, that's completely wrong. And, and look at your own German chancellor, who is the leader in Europe pushing for more and more integration, for more and more powers for Brussels. The centralizing force is at the heart of Berlin. 
uh, actually, if you want, if you want evidence of that. And that's, that's an extremely important point. There is a huge debate in Europe between those who want self-determination and those who are pushing for more and more powers for the European Union and Brussels. There is one comment, Constanza, which you, you probably remember from uh, European Commission President Jean-Claude Juncker, who, who was, until very recently, like a couple of months ago, calling for an EU army, and said that at the moment the European Union's common defense policy has less cohesion than a flock of chickens, I believe, <laughs> was the yeah. exact, was it? Yeah. Look, I mean, there is a serious debate to be had on this, and I think uh, it's unfortunate if Juncker uses expression like an, like an EU army. He does that, obviously, to get, to get media attention, and it works, but it works on the But the Germans ways. were his biggest supporters the, in that. Yeah, okay, now two points. The, <laughs> Angela Merkel, just to <laughs> set the record straight here, is the woman who turned Germany away from deeper European integration, to espouse what she calls the union method, which is intergovernmentalism, pure and simple. Yeah? Um, and the Germans have actually resisted um, the uh, European integration on economic issues such as banking union. Yeah? The Germans have been dragging their feet on this. As for defense, what the Germans have been suggesting, and I would suggest that this is something very interesting, the Germans have, have been putting forth something that they call uh, the framework um, uh, nation concept which would allow Germany to provide a military backbone in cases where we cannot presume on the presence of an American backbone because Americans need to deploy their assets elsewhere. What that means is that smaller nations can specialize or concentrate on certain capabilities, which they have already de facto done because of technology costs, and then uh, attach themselves to German, uh, to German units. That is happening in very important and very creative ways. And it is Europeanizing your, uh, forces as we speak. It is creating common forces. But again, this is not an ideological drive. It's driven by practical necessity and by defense costs. And it is not anti-NATO. It is all of it is fully NATO interoperable. I think we will definitely come back to more NATO Sorry questions. Sorry to be so technical, but. Um, we'll definitely come back to, to NATO. I want to just um, launch one more question before I go to the audience, and that is about what used to be the biggest issue that I covered in Brussels and uh, was asked to cover by U.S. Uh, US media clients, and that was the refugee and migration crisis. Until terrorism hit, we were talking only about refugee and migration for, for days and days and weeks and weeks. Um, and it also exacerbated the cracks in European solidarity like nothing else except the Greek, the Greek crisis until that point had done. And Costanza, you even wrote that, that at this point, after all of these strains, that the European project is in danger of falling <coughs> apart. Um, and I, I, I thought that during, during Greece. I thought I'd never heard European governments speaking in that way to each other until the migration crisis came, and we've never seen anything like this. Countries literally building fences, mm -hmm. not just Hungary. Um, and so I would like to, to get your takes on this. Does the U.S., can the U.S. do more to ease the burden of Europe? Now, I know what you think about this. You, I, I, I'm going to say something for him. He says that the European Union is, is doomed anyway and the refugee crisis is just going to... Doom it some more. Do, doom it some more. H hasten, its, hasten its welcome, de welcome yeah, demise. demise. Yeah. Um, but should the U.S. do more? And that isn't just take 10,000 Syrian refugees, which is nothing, nothing to help, Europe, to help ease the burden of those countries that are getting hundreds of thousands per day. So what should the U.S. do? Is this another test of transatlantic uh, solidarity? What can the U.S. do? Should it be doing more? Um, or did Europe is, Europe, is Europe just stuck with its own problems? I, we would look at, at things like you, you can blame the U.S. back, back in Libya, the, what, what used to be the, the main route of, of refugee smuggling and, and transit until, until Turkey became such a big hub. Um, so I'd, li I'd like your views on that. And we've really got to stick to time. If, if everybody could answer, if everyone wants to answer, let's have, have one minute each, please. All right, There's the you. clock. It's simple. I mean, the United States will obviously should take more refugees, but we're not going to take 100,000 refugees. We're not going to take 150,000 refugees. Even 100,000 is nothing. Even if we could take 100,000, that's not going to stop the problem in Europe. Right. It's going to stop the problem in Europe is ending the conflict. In, in, in Syria and bringing stability to, to Iraq. What about Libya? Yeah. Um, you know, if we can do that, that would help too. But your biggest and most urgent challenge right now is in, in, in Syria and in, in, in northern Iraq. And in the absence of, of, of real clear strategy with coherent ends and long-term commitment, commitment of resources, that is military and financial, that problem's not going to be resolved. 
That's how the United States can make, make an, an effective contribution to this challenge that's facing Europe. Thanks, that was quick. Can I maybe come at this from a, from a slightly perhaps uh, uncon unconventional side Please. and suggest that the degree to which we are able to not just absorb but integrate and assimilate Muslim migrants from conflict zones in the Middle East will have a significant impact on our credibility and our legitimacy as actors in the Middle East and that these two things are therefore connected. Um, so I'm suggesting that we do, we not be sucked into false dichotomies yeah, and say we have to do one or the other. We do both of these things. We manage, we, we, we gracefully accept the refugee, refugee challenge and deal with it, but we also try and deal with the root causes and we also try and take some of the burden off Turkey, Lebanon and Jordan, which have taken a far bigger burden than we have so far and help stabilize those countries which are on the brink of disintegration themselves. But your chancellor tried to do that and ended up also having to close your borders, even temporarily, and, and limit the flow. She, yes, that was but, her, but her is, original but is, idea. But these are temporary measures, and, and, I, and I still think that given what, I mean, people, I think, in, uh, outside of Germany are not aware of just how many refugees and migrants we have integrated since 1945. I think even Germans weren't aware until people sort of dug up the numbers and realized just how much this was. I mean, my society has completely changed. You know, even since my childhood. We used to be white and Catholic or Protestants. That has utterly changed. And so I, I am actually reasonably confident that we can do this. And I think it adds, it, there is a direct linkage to our credibility in foreign policy. But, and, but I'm also relieved that Germany is now sending recce tornadoes, is sending a frigate, um, and is sending ground troops uh, not to fight in, in Syria because, I mean, we appear to all to be agreed that that is not on the cards at this point. But I can, see, I can see my government doing more if we all decide to do more. But that was I a decision that came out of France's calling of 42.7, wasn't it? I'm not sure that was the only. I mean, look, I think we have a very, very close relationship with France in much the same way as we have a very close relationship with Poland. And, and a threat to France is a threat to us in the same way that Ukraine is a threat to Poland and therefore is a threat to us. And mm -hmm. that, that, the, I think it, it follows from that that we help. But the larger question to which I think none of us have any simple answers, and I, I would distrust anybody who has a simple answer, is how to deal, how to truly grapple with the root causes. But, I, but as, a, as I say, I think the way we deal with Muslims in our midst is going to have a significant impact on that. And let's not forget that. Well, I agree, Terry, that the United States needs to play a leading role to try to contain and tamp down the conflict at its source. We also can play a leading role in mobilizing international support for dealing with refugees and internally displaced people in the countries, in fact, that Constanza just mentioned, in Lebanon and Turkey, Jordan. Um, and that includes, by the way, Asian contributions, not just European contributions or American contributions. And then, yes, the United States can support Europe in terms of how we can try to help take off maybe just at least a symbolic number of refugees um, to show that we care but in reality, we can't fix the problem that way. It's consistent with our values and it's our interest in global order. Does 10,000 show we care? I don't know what the number is. <laughs> okay. Niall? Yeah, on the refugee issue, um, I firstly, as, you know, as Patrick says, um, you know, more should be done to assist with the, the refugee camps in nations bordering uh, Syria. Ultimately, you know, if we want to end the refugee crisis, we've got to deal with ISIS, and we've got to emphatically defeat ISIS, and that's what we have to do. And that, that's the most important role the United States can play. I mean, taking 10,000 refugees is not going to make any difference. On the European front, I would say that, you know, the refugee issue should be a matter for nation states. If Poland or Hungary does not wish to take any uh, refugees or migrants, that's their choice. Or only it Christian should, ones. It should not be the, or they, if they want to take only Christian refugees who are the, by far the most persecuted in Syria, then that is the choice of the Polish or Hungarian governments. Right? Mm. And it should be their decision alone. This idea that Germany can dictate to the rest of Europe how many refugees each country should, should take has been firmly and emphatically rejected, and rightly so. It if wasn't Germ only Germany. If Germany wishes to take 800,000, 1.6 million uh, refugees, that's, that's up to Germany, and that's, you know, it's up to them how they're going to deal with that situation. But then but it's they, also up to Germany how much money they, they want to allocate to the Eastern European they, states who aren't helping. They must not, uh, you know, Germany's in no position 
to be lecturing other countries about who they should or should not be taking inside their own uh, country. Uh, and I, I do think the, the German attempt here to, yet again, I mean, dominate Europe has been completely rejected by many countries, especially in Eastern and Central uh, Europe, and also by, uh, by Britain as well. It was only four countries, I believe, in the end who were opposed to that measure, even though they may have been strong-armed. Only four. I think you'll find more countries than that. Okay. And, and, uh, but this, at, the, at, the end, at the end of the day, this is, this is an issue about controlling your own borders, self-determination. And no country is under any obligation to take a certain number of, of refugees. And if Angela Merkel wants to make that personal invitation to large numbers of migrants, that's her own choice, and the German people should face up with the consequences of that. Do you know which country has the most expats living in Europe? UK? It's you. <laughs> yep, it's and, uh, and that, that's an example of Britain being an you know, incredibly successful entrepreneurial uh, society. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Unlike Poland, right? And, uh, and you know, that, that, is, uh, that is a testament to free markets, capitalism, uh, and taking a lot of the best talent from across the world, including from the United States. Which is it might not be true once they need a, a visa, right? Like Roman well, well, why, why would they need a visa? Well, <laughs> if you leave, they might need a, a work visa. Uh, well, you know, I think that the idea that Great Britain has the world's fifth largest economy, it will overtake Germany's economy by 2030. Uh, the idea that the United Kingdom will somehow be sidelined, isolated, after it leaves the European Union, I, I think is, is scaremongering of the lowest common denominator. Uh, and, and I think that, uh, you know, I'm very few people are buying that argument in Britain itself, actually. Fair enough. Okay, I would like to take questions from the audience. Sir. First in the front. Um, I, I did have a microphone, people. Thanks. Uh, yes, I'm Russell King, retired federal employee. I haven't taken a side, side in this debate yet, but I believe that you should not put all your eggs in one basket, and you should be able to move the eggs from one basket to another without breaking them. And I believe the U.S. military is designed to, to be in two and a half conflicts at one time. Just recently, we were in <laughs> Afghanistan and Iraq, so that's two conflicts in CENTCOM region, okay? So you're arguing you come over here and PACOM over here, but I'm wondering if you could comment about inter-theater mobility, the movement of resources from one command to another, and I know there's also been AFRICOM, there's been a new command that just came, but from, from a standpoint of the commands as well as the logistics, how has, has inter-theater mobility improved over the years? Thank you, and he jumped into that and did it perfectly. Um, please name, give your name and your organization and not too much editorializing and get to a question quickly, thanks. Oh, it's fine. We, we have a global force. The U.S. has global interests, so wherever the forces are based, they have to be prepared for global contingencies. The administration has announced that they're shifting, um, especially naval assets, but also air assets, from a 50-50% ratio based in Pacific versus the rest of the world to a 60-40. But that's on the basis of a smaller and shrinking force structure. So in fact, what the administration is mostly doing is putting the best face on preserving the status quo but it is improvements. I mean, there are, I'm not, I don't want to trivialize the improvements uh, because some of them are the high quality of ships that we're building, although in some cases the littoral combat ship has more limited capacity than some of our traditional ships. So it's a mixed bag in terms of what we're building up in the Asia Pacific. But it's meant to be focused on ready for deployments in the Asia Pacific and the Gulf Indian Ocean regions. So reinforcing the 5th Fleet in, in Bahrain, the 7th Fleet in Yokosuka, Japan, uh, but for global missions. And we could argue that we should put a second carrier in Japan and make an operational command in Japan and make it a rotating fleet that could go all the way through the Indo-Pacific on patrols with other allies like Australia, but new partners like India um, and other allies like the Philippines eventually, as well as Japan and, and Korea. Um, the reality is, though, that these forces are still lacking in numbers. So we're not in the Mediterranean. We're not in the north. So there are reasons, there are real shortfalls I'm concerned about as well globally, but that has to do with our global investment and our force posture. We can't afford everything, so we're going to have to leverage allies. We're asking all allies to do more, not just in Europe, 
where we're critical and have been critical for years about not meeting their spending targets on NATO, but we're also asking all of our Asian allies to do more, so much so that our pushing Japan to new defense guidelines is being criticized by even our Korean allies as maybe too aggressive because they're not comfortable. But we're, we need our allies to do more. We need our force posture that's ready to be global, but in reality we have some real gaps. Thank you. Um, and I would like to point out to anybody who's watching this on live streaming or anybody here, um, you can tweet about our debate at hashtag capital M capital I debate. And because I asked on Twitter people to send me questions and I got a rather meager response, I want to reward those who did. And this would go into, Ian, did you want to answer, did you want to answer sure. this question? But let me throw in the question of Stefan Sosanto. He said he wanted to hear more about the role of nuclear deterrence. Um, in, in a, a transatlantic sense, and also um, missile defense burden sharing, and that would fall under the NATO category um, to a large extent. To follow on Pat's comments, I mean, inter cross-theater operations has become a refined art in the, in the U.S. military. Just look at the operations in Afghanistan and Iraq and the role that UCOM's forces played. Almost all UCOM forces somehow ended up one way or the other, one time or the other, in either of those theaters. So that's not, not really a challenge. The problem is, is that and since we're talking about pivot to Europe, is that the 60-40 uh, reorientation uh, of the current administration has made in terms of a global force posture, 60% going to, to the Pacific or Pacific-oriented, ignores the kind of the challenges that we face in in Europe, uh, ignores I think sign, warning signs that were emerging well before the Obama administration that we were on the track to a confrontational relationship with Russia. The invasion of Georgia in 2008 should have been a signal. Uh, the 2007 attack, cyber attack on, on Estonia should have been a signal. The articulation of policies by Putin 2004-2005 about his aims and, concern, and objectives in Europe should have been a signal. So what we did was we basically pulled our forces out of Europe ignoring uh, what was a clearly emergent threat. And while we were downsizing our forces over there, and while the Europeans were downsizing their military capabilities, the Russians were embarking on a long-term modernization plan of which we're now seeing some of its, of its products, a more effective uh, special force operations forces capability, greater deployability of forces, more rapid mobilization rates, uh, more effective and accurate strike cap capacities with Iskander caliber missiles, uh, increasingly uh, uh, capable air defense systems. Uh, this is why the pivot away from Europe has, I think, in my mind, been a mistake. It's not an issue of inter-theater lift. It's an issue of being where you need to be. And uh, we need to have more uh, robust force posture in Europe if we're going to effectively work with the Europeans to deal with this not no longer emergent but very real Russian threat that we face. And uh, missile defense, especially with regard to either Russia uh, at whom it is not directed, or perhaps Patrick at North Korea at whom it may well have been, or Iran. Are you asking me? Or? Either one of you. Just well, we, a quick answer yeah, on, 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 on missile defense. On, on missile defense, uh, the NATO U.S. missile NATO. defense policy regarding Russia has, has been completely mistaken. It's, it's not about it's, Russia, remember? Exactly. As I said, it's completely mistaken. <laughs> I mean, to say that we're going to be orienting our, our threats against Iranian missiles uh, is, is nice and probably useful, but to intentionally not direct or avert our radar coverage and our interceptive capabilities from Russian threat is beyond me. So you say we should openly say this is directed against a Russian threat? Missile defense is a defensive action. It's, help. Uh, it's, it's not threatening to, to Russia. Uh, it's beyond me why in the face of increasingly provocative Russian military conduct, in the face of increasingly offensive force posture in Russia, here we're talking about the caliber cruise missiles, we're talking about Iskanders, we're talking about Russian exercises in Kaliningrad, in, in Kalinin, deployments of Iskander yeah. in Kaliningrad. We're talking about Russian exercises that simulate um, the use of ballistic missiles, sometimes with nuclear warheads, against the West. We should have missile defense against that. Uh, there's no question in, in my mind on that. We have problems in Asia as well. I mean, even the commander of U.S. forces, Korea, has had a hard time convincing our South Korean allied government that we need another layer of missile defense. That um, to protect U.S. forces as well as Korean forces against the growing arsenal uh, that North Korea is trying to build, however unsuccessfully, um, and expanding a nuclear weapons program that could parallel that of Pakistan if they're allowed to continue over the next five, ten years. I mean, missile defense is a global issue as well.
because systems, uh, the connections and the information systems and the redundancy and resiliency built in are essential for our operations. In Guam, U.S. territory in the Pacific, we just had the largest delivery ever of a forward deployment of THAAD missiles. And that's because we're replacing the interceptors in preparation probably for the May 2016 North Korean Congress, which hasn't happened for decades, because there's likely to be an ICBM launch uh, about that time, I would suspect. I'm just guessing. But the, the reality is that we have to protect our assets in Asia Pacific, reassure allies and partners, and not give in to Russia or Chinese uh, sort of pressure about these systems are hurting them. They're not. These systems are too minor to affect a major military power like Russia or China. Which isn't exactly good news. It isn't exactly good news, but it's <laughs> the reality. Deterrence works, though. Uh, quickly, Kurt, do I get 10 extra minutes because we started late? Yeah. Nice. Okay, uh, more questions? Um, up in the middle? I'm not it's sure you should because it's being live streamed. Yeah, wait for the mic. Thanks. And let's try, to, let's try to do kind of bullet rounds now. One okay. minute answers, please, from my panel. Sure. My name and you is can direct them towards somebody if you want. Or they can just my name is Michael Bakalu, recent graduate of Korea University, and I have a question related to Russia specifically. So when we compare Russia to the Soviet Union, we see a couple facts, that Russia is much smaller, much less populous. This part should be very short because yeah. everybody here knows that. Uh, fair enough. <laughs> and so I would say in the context of Russia being relatively more compact than the Soviet Union in a lot of ways, does Russia solely justify a pivot back to Europe? Okay. Who wants it? Oh, I'll love that one. Okay, take it. Me too. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, look, Russia just invaded Ukraine, yeah. invaded Georgia. Uh, it's conducting offensive exercises. Just this spring, it conducted an exercise in which it simulated the seizure of parts of northern Norway, uh, the Åland Island of Finland, the Gotland Island of Sweden, and Bornholm of, 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 of Denmark. And now Turkey. Uh, yeah. And now we've had, you know, Turkey, which is a series of Russian provocations challenging the airspace, sea space of, of allies. Russia right now has a, a very sophisticated capability to rapidly mobilize a large amount of forces to quickly seize a limited swath of territory in its proximity. And we're not postured for that. And in light of what Putin is saying he plans to do, in light of what his objectives are, and the way he conducts his exercises, you have to respond to that, because otherwise you're setting yourself up for a fiasco. Nice short answer. It no, doesn't take a whole pivot, so. though, to deter <laughs> okay. Russia. I mean, China has been growing by 10% per annum since Deng Xiaoping's reform, market reforms in 1978. If you look out to the middle of the century, even with the slowing down of the economy that we see now in China, China is hoping that the Chinese dream on the 100th anniversary of the establishment of the People's Republic of China in 2049 will be the dominant power. The United States has to be there to engage it, to dissuade it, and to shape the region to our liking. Not because it's a direct threat yet, but we don't know about the future. So we have to do both of these things at the same time. Yes, Russia, more attention now, but that doesn't take a pivot. And right. uh, you wrote that it could be by 2030, I think. I read one of, your, one of your papers that said it could be, if not the, at least a dominant world power already by 2030. So can the U.S. even afford to look away from Asia? U.S. has to grow. We need a growth strategy as well, which is why we can talk about the Trans-Pacific Partnership and TTIP. Those are the two sides of the flying buttresses that hold up the future global trading regime that we would like to see in the 21st century. It's essential, and it's both Asia and Europe. Thank you. Russia challenges fundamental European values and principles. <clears throat> principles, sovereignty, self-determination, agency of civil societies. That cannot be let to stand. We are going to have to counter that, we're going to have to contain it, we're going to have to deter and defend. And we will have to do that with hard power and we will have to increase our defense budgets and deploy hard forces wherever that is necessary. However, that effort also has a soft power side. It starts with the resilience of our societies, of our economies and our political systems. That is where the EU comes in and that is where national governments in the EU come in. Again, I'm not at all ideological about this, although I do firmly believe, unlike Niall, that the EU has a role to play here. Um, and this soft power arena is ultimately our primary responsibility, but it is one where America can help us. 
TTIP, for example, has a role to play in our economic prosperity. TTIP is a good idea that is g whose strategic be uh, importance goes well beyond uh, the, its uh, a free trade zone, um, but that has been badly sold. And in my own country, 100,000 people went on the streets against it yes, like, uh, re uh, recently. We also have to win the, the war that the Russians are waging against us in, uh, on, in the social media zone. They are funding fascist parties in Europe. They and in response, the EU is, is not funding a five-person bureau. <laughs> you know that the, the, the EU's counter-troll unit yes. is about five people <laughs> which don't have a budget. They're all seconded. Yeah, but, the Na but NATO, NATO has a center more. of strategic NATO communication has, in, in, in Latvia. I mean, again, you have, to, you have to sort of ask yourself where you want to put this and you don't want to duplicate. But the reality is, again, I don't think that one should fight propaganda with counter-propaganda. You fight it by defending your free and open and liberal societies. Yeah. Um, how can I not respond? Uh, but I, I do like the idea of a counter-troll unit. That, that sounds excellent. I think I made that up. But, <laughs> um, <coughs> but uh, talking, of, uh, you know, talking of Russia it does actually feel a bit like Moscow in this room. It's so cold here. But, um, uh, you know, you make a very good point, you know, uh, comparison between Russia today and, you know, the Soviet Empire. Uh, and sure, you know, the, the Russian power is nowhere as great as it was under the days of the Soviets. However, I think Vladimir Putin is, frankly, just as evil as many of the people who ran the Soviet Empire. You know, a man who can uh, supply missiles, shoot down a, an airliner over eastern Ukraine. I mean, this is barbarism and savagery. It's pure terrorism backed by the Russian state. And we should not forget what we're dealing with in terms of standing up to, to the Russians. But the Russians understand only one thing, and that is a message of strength and resolve. I don't think uh, Mr. Putin cares one jot what you know, the latest EU resolution is. That's not true. Now, the, the sanctions have hurt his economy, and that's, pr that's proven. You don't think he cares? Well, I, okay, okay. So, san sanctions, of course, implemented by individual European countries. Under an uh, EU. But, <laughs> as you say, there is a... No, no, no. Maybe no. we can get... No, NATO do we, to we need to, you know, we need to distinguish between <laughs> the power of the European <laughs> Union, the power of the nation states, and I don't see why you they think that is... They could all 28 have done it you know, unilaterally, but people, they didn't. People will die for the nation state. They're not going to die for the European <clears> Union. <throat> I can assure you that on the battlefield. And this, Vladimir Putin knows this. And this is not a laughing matter here. Uh, Mr. Putin understands when NATO stands up to uh, Russian expansionism. He understands when the United States stands up to the Russian superpower. Unfortunately, at the moment, there isn't a lot of US leadership. And the Russian reset, I think, has been fundamentally uh, disastrous. But we need to be very, very clear with regard to what we're dealing with in terms of the Russian threat. And Vladimir Putin is quite capable of doing what he has done already in the Crimea and in Ukraine and Georgia to other parts of Europe, especially the Baltic states, to uh, Poland, for example, with very good reason. Leaders in the Baltics and in Eastern and Central Europe are deeply concerned uh, about the Russian threat and also about the lack of uh, American leadership on this issue. They're also concerned about the uh, the lack of leadership coming from inside of, of Europe as well on this, on this matter. And there's an awful lot of appeasement of the, uh, of the Russians, especially coming from Germany and France, I might add, actually. Uh, and it is important, I think, that on both sides of the Atlantic, we see the kind of leadership that is needed to stand up to what is, in my view, a, a brutal regime in Moscow that has to be uh, confronted. Okay, another question. Hashtag MI debate. Everyone? I'm sorry, can I, can I just mention that <laughs> Merkel is holding together the sanctions consensus? <laughs> you you I mean, just did. Just for the Good record, job. I mean, no. for anybody who isn't aware of this, I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll you know, wave on the rest. So. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, good evening. Kutelia, uh, McCain Institute uh, Next Generation uh, Leader. Uh, I'm from Georgia. Uh, so, uh, since it was mentioned... I suspect this will be about Russia. Uh, no, it's not about <laughs> Russia. It's more about vision and idea. So uh, uh, it was mentioned that people uh, would not die for the European Union. Uh, uh, people would die for the idea, and uh, uh, Ukrainians died in the streets with the European Union flag in their hands. So That's a good point. Uh, and now to, uh, coming to the idea and division. Uh, to navigate the really troubled waters for, trans for transatlantic partnership, uh, uh, we need a compass, and that compass, compass was existed. It was an idea of Europe whole and free and peace. But somehow it disappeared. So, and you get a bits and pieces of this vision uh, 
what should be the transatlantic partnership or what's the future of the euro. So how the European nations or European leaders see the future of the euro, like in Germany or in Great Britain, and how the US sees the future of the Europe, and where is a discrepancy between those two visions? Thank you. So, is there a fundamental difference between how the two sides see the, the, the two sides of the ocean see the future of Europe? I mean, we know Nile. Well, <clears throat> quick answer. Let, let me respond by this. I mean, really I, quick I think answers, that, guys. Um, you know, the United States should apply the same you know, values with regard to Europe that, that are applied here at home. I respect for sovereignty and self-determination, the right to decide your own future. And this is at the heart of the European debate at the moment, which is why it's important that the United States needs to be on the right side of history here, rather than lecturing Europeans about how they should be voting in their referendums. And the Obama administration is, you know, is issuing countless edicts on this, on this issue. It is a um, it is a, a direct intervention in internal uh, affairs there. But it's helped your um, vote, you believe, right? Uh, uh, sorry. It's, it's helped your side of the vote, you it, believe. It actually, it does, it does ironically help, yes, that, that's correct. But uh, that doesn't uh, remove, uh, the, you know, the fact that, that I think that the idea that uh, US administration should be lecturing European publics about how to vote on their own particular issues Okay. Of national but you've made sovereignty. that point already, so talk yeah. about what the future of Europe is. Uh, yeah, and so, you know, with regard to, you know, the future of Europe, it's very clear that the United States, I, I, I believe, you know, should be, uh, should be in favor of, of a Europe of nation states rather than a supranational institution. A supranational entity does not benefit the United States on the world, uh, on the world stage. And, you know, Henry Kissinger once spoke about, uh, you know, this idea of having a uh, you know, just one uh, phone line to Europe, or one, one person picking up the phone. Well, if that person is, you know, Jean-Claude Juncker, uh, who is probably the most anti-American uh, figure, actually, in, in Europe, um, that's not exactly going to help Washington, is it? And so I think that U.S. policymakers need to think through uh, what is, in my view, a really outdated strategy with regard to the future of Europe. Okay, this side, you know, I one of you. I, I just, as, as an American, I'll say two things. On on NATO, looking at Kurt Volker and perhaps others here, 10 or 15 years ago, there was a real core group that was excited and animated about a Europe whole and free. And they saw that uh, vision through the two institutions, EU enlargement and NATO enlargement. And I was part, I like to think I was part of that community. I think it was important. It was a powerful vision. It gave a purpose. And we made great progress on that. You know, multiple rounds of enlargement, NATO 28 now, I forget how many are, are, are in the EU. And that has led to a more robust, more resilient uh, Europe, more robust, resilient transatlantic community. My fear is that over the last eight years, because of a lack of US government commitment to that vision, that has sort of died. And as a result, you can find different pockets and levels of support and opposition to this vision across the, across the Atlantic even across Washington, D.C. I'm kind of hopeful there's a silver lining to Putin's revanchist agenda. It's reanimating in the eyes of many people the importance and validity of that, of that vision and the need to support it. Well, they hoped that would make European governments raise their defense spending, and it hasn't exactly done well, so. Well, there's been a small, small progress Tiny. in that direction, not as much as we, we would want, but there has been, you know, the invitation to Montenegro. It's a step in the right direction. But more is going to have to be done. Uh, to really give this, 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 this vision real life and renewed momentum. And that's got, I think, got to really include the United States standing at the helm on this. But then a point on Niles. Niles, you know, I'm not a big fan of bureaucracies. Uh, and I know that the EU bureaucracy has gone out of control in some cases. But that's not a reason to trash the EU. That's not a reason to blow it up. Reform it? Yes. Uh, and then I would say also, I don't think it has been U.S. policy, Democrat or Republican, to drive a bureaucratization of, of the EU. We want to see political comity. We want to see economic integration. And I think that's a positive thing. You know, as someone of Central European de of descent, the EU has done great things for Central Europe. We have highways and pipelines that come from EU funding. Uh, that's been a benefit. Yes, it's, a, it's, a, it's an institution that has its faults and its quirks and its inefficiencies, but ultimately it's done a good thing for Europe 
It's not a good thing for the transatlantic relationship. Can I take another question? I'd like question, to jump in on this. No, I'd like really to jump quickly, in on the, on the question, question of your own free because this does matter, and it also it speaks to the to Niall's absurd point about German appeasement. <laughs> um, <laughs> she wouldn't let it go. Yeah, and I ha and I'm not no, I'm not going to let that go because I can't. Uh, it's insulting. It's also just factually wrong, well, which is true, why it's actually, insulting. Um, but the, the here is here is the deal. I think that in in Berlin it is fully understood that the, the stability, prosperity, and yes, democratic transformation of Europe's eastern periphery is in, not just in line with our most fundamental values, you know, and the values that informed the democratic revolutions of 1989 in East Germany and in Poland and in Hungary and elsewhere, but is also in line with our strategic interests. Germany's foreign ministry is fully invested in Ukrainian transformation. There is a whole special task force that uh, is, spends a great deal of attention on working with the Ukrainians, on, on, on progress across the entire spectrum of economic, political, and civil society transformation. Um, the Germans are fully invested in the Warsaw Summit and in the commitments of Wales. Um, and I think that you would find it very hard to fault. You can disagree with, the, I, I would prefer to have the, more, the, the Poles in the Normandy and Minsk formats. I would like to have the US playing a greater role in there. I would like to certainly have the UK play a much larger role in countering Putin and in, and in the diplomacy and in the transformational efforts there in, in the region. But to suggest that the Germans are appeasing, to suggest that the Germans are on the morally on the wrong side of the story is deeply wrong. Thank you. Patrick, can I go to another question or do you have? Well, a one-liner on that would be in between these two positions here because there is a middle ground, a wide middle ground. And that's, you know, Europe needs to pivot back to taking security seriously. <clears throat> it never stopped mattering to the United States, but it did stop caring a lot about security. It's catching up now. It's starting to turn the corner. Yeah. These are very reassuring yeah. words, but we'd like to see more. Sure. And if, if the European Union's yeah. getting in the way of effective defense, then I'm worried about that. If it's not, if it's complementary, so. yeah. then that's a good thing. That answers one of the questions of my other Twitter questioners, Zebulun Karlander. Thank you for writing. Um, question here. Hello, my name is Daniel Robinson, and I'm a freelance foreign policy writer. Anyway, I have a question. Uh, given Russia's erratic behavior the last number of years, their deployment of the gas weapon, as well as the implementation of the Iran deal, should a Republican president succeed President Obama? Could that potentially be another potential fracture point for the EU and the U.S., given the EU's depressed economic state, and also given Russia's recent actions, zero diversification uh, crisis they're facing in terms of energy? Well, I mean, there's two, there's two angles to this. One, I would really like to see the U.S. Uh, get rid of its prohibition on exporting LNG, which is, I mean, would be very helpful. Um, on, uh, I would like to see the EU getting, uh, going ahead with Europeanizing the, the oil and gas market, uh, particularly the gas market. Um, and uh, before anybody raises it, I'll raise North Stream, Stream 2, the pipeline that is circumventing, that is designed to circumvent Ukraine and the Baltics. Uh, I would, I would say um, that the, I'm, you know, I don't like the political signal that this sends yeah, from, from, from the companies that are running this. You know? This is a Gazprom plus, uh, I think, five European countries, including the UK, by the way, just in case we're getting in that direction again. Um, uh, and it's, you know, I don't like it, but we're, you know, we don't have the kind of system where the government, unless we're actually involved, uh, we're operating in a sanctions environment like on Iran, where the government can actually say, you, you can't do this. I mean, it could, I could see very, very well running up against EU commission rules, for which, by the way, the EU, EU commission would be very useful. But, um, but I also, frankly, don't think it's going to be economically viable. It's, it's questionable even whether North Stream 1 is going to be economically viable. The other thing is that the Ukrainians have worked very hard and very well on their storage capacities. Um, with EU help. With EU help, exactly. And, uh, and, we're, and the reverse flow of gas to Ukraine is now in such a state that I think uh, we have far less to worry about than we did, say, two years ago. Yeah? But it is certainly true that, that Russian behavior on this front has really mobilized people. And the problem here is people like to mention that, that Germany uh, imports 36 39%, depending on how you count, of its oil and gas from Russia. The smaller European, Eastern European economies are 100% dependent on, Euro on Russian oil and gas. The three Balts, Bulgarians, Romanians, 
That is where the real problems less lie, so now. and that's where we less now. Yes, but but that is where we really need to work. That's a, in other words, that's a live issue that people are working on, but that needs more work. And this time of year, it's always huge because Russia starts causing problems and yeah, cutting true. off the the flow to countries true. like Belgium, where I live. Most of the European countries do need some of that gas. Um, now you wanted to say something about that. Uh, yes, quickly, I, very quick. One I'm minute. glad that uh, no, Daniel, you you mentioned uh, Iran. Uh, which hasn't really been discussed uh, tonight, an extremely mm -hmm. important issue. Um, and I would hope actu actually that the next US president would tear up this uh, abominable agreement with Tehran, which frankly amounts to a surrender to their demands. And I can see why the European Union was so, so deeply in favor of it. Um, and uh, on the issue of Iran, you know, it's, it's interesting to note the, the plane loads of officials and businessmen, you know, flying in from uh, Berlin and Paris into Tehran following that, that deal, the UK, which, is, which was why it was so, so important, I think, for, you know, for European countries backing uh, this, this agreement. I mean, it's largely about money, uh, whereas you know, I think the Iran issue should be viewed through the prism of security and the future of the free world and preventing Iran from becoming a nuclear power. I don't think this agreement does that, uh, does that at all. Uh, and, and I think that um, with a new administration coming, if, if indeed it is a Republican administration, then I would expect to see this Iran uh, agreement to be uh, probably torn to shreds, actually. And, and that will, of course, raise uh, important uh, issues in terms of transatlantic uh, debate. And so I think you're, you're very right to, to be raising this, uh, this issue. It will be a major area of contention between the United States uh, and, and Europe, uh, if, uh, if a new administration comes in and, uh, uh, and tears up the, the agreement. I, I'd expect a Republican administration to, to actually do that. Okay. Can I get, take another question? Or anything you need to say? Okay. Um, one more here, and I'll, t I'll take both of these, and then we've got to go. I'm getting the wrap, so make it really, really fast, please. You guys too. Am I on? Okay. My name is Ann Thompson, formerly with USAID and World Vision and International Public Health Consultant. <laughs> If each of you four distinguished speakers were tapped to advise um, policy to the current administration, what would your two top policy points advice be? And what would, how would that be similar or different if um, the same opportunity were given for a Republican administration with the backdrop of America not leading from behind? Okay, and I'll take this question too, and then you can choose which one of those you want from my panelists because then we have to go. Um, Sorry, I can't see you guys very well. Yeah, I know. Right. Bad light. Um, I'm Gary Sargent. I'm a retired Army Special Forces officer. Um, I spent a day or two in the Levant in my life, and I also spent a day or two in Germany. And um, I can't, I got to hold myself calm just for a hair, but um, people forget that about 14 years ago, we took down the Taliban with about 100 special operators. Okay? <laughs> and people so forget. That's enough. People forget that fact, but the bottom line is that initial gradual insertion and helping indigenous capability be built is actually not the worst policy in the world. And I talked then, to somebody on the other side of it today, too, just in preparation for this, who says if, if, the, if the administration were serious, they would be doing a lot more than that, that that's a Band-Aid. Yeah, and, and it may be true, but the other point is, is I think emboldened Iran was directly related to our failures in Iraq. Okay, so that I just was a love your heavy you comments. Yes. Okay, all right. Okay, so this is our last question. So, um, and then we are going to each have one. You are going to have one minute each to to wrap up. So, before I get hauled off, gonged. Um, okay, shoot. Now, which uh, one yeah. are you going to take? Uh, one minute, please. There's the yeah. So, advice to the current president, next next president. Um, you know, extremely good question. I would say, you know, firstly, uh, you've got to confront ISIS and defeat ISIS and the broader Islamist terrorist threat. I mean, that's the immediate priority that has to be addressed. And I, I do think President Obama is a deer in the headlights at the moment. He doesn't have a clear strategy at all, and that shows on the world stage. And frankly, it's embarrassing for the world superpower to be projecting that kind of uh, message. Um, secondly, uh, I, I think that the United States has to be serious about confronting not only Iran's nuclear program, but also its ambitions in the Middle East to, to be the regional superpower there. And that's a point raised by the, the gentleman there. Uh, and a third point, 
you've got to confront the Russians and stand up to Russian aggression uh, in Europe uh, and also send a message to the Russians that you know, they can't assert their, sort of, their influence as they see fit wherever they want to in the Middle East. Uh, and, and this is a result of a vacuum of American leadership in the Middle East. The Russians have moved in there. Uh, you've, got to te- you know, you've got to send that message to, uh, to, to Russia that the United States is still prepared to lead on the world stage. Uh, and so you know, we need to have a president who really has a backbone and is willing to lead uh, as the world's superpower must lead. Okay, one minute. Well, especially for the next administration, again, we don't really choose what we have to deal with on security. We are going to have to manage other major powers like China and Russia, especially when they act in a revisionist manner. We're going to have to deal with transnational terrorism in in groups like the Islamic State. We're going to have to deal with Iran and North Korea. We have to deal with all of these things. So what are the two things the next administration should do? Well, in in the most simple terms, it needs to negotiate from strength. So it needs to have the force structure and the leadership behind it to use force and power to achieve the strategic results we want vis-a-vis these big strategic di- issues. But we also need to use soft power. And since you're from AID or were, um, you know, we need some imagination on how we mobilize uh, international support, because we're not going to pay for all the money, for a human development initiative for the 21st century. And that's going beyond just the poverty reduction that has been the focus of a lot of the development work. And it's capturing and competing with things like the Chinese Silk Road idea. They're going to build more infrastructure than we can, but we have ideas for technology and for healthcare and for the environment and for energy and education. And Europe and Asia allies and the United States can do a lot with that. All right. Um, Afghanistan, don't get me started. I was there a number of times as a reporter. The first time in January 2002 when things were still quite rough. And I have gone for evening walks in Kabul and Kunduz on my own uh, without risking my life. And I regret the fact that that is no longer possible. And I think that we are to some degree to blame for that, but that would be another evening of conversation. Um, As I I think it's become somewhat clear that I don't have a problem with using hard force um, where that is necessary and useful. But my advice to the next American president, whatever party he or she belongs to, would be to work with us, to help us grow out of the infantile codependency that too many of us have been for us uh, for too long a time. Help us do on our own what we should by rights and in your interest be doing on our own. And help us do it in such a way that whenever we need to work together, whether it's on politics, diplomacy, economics, trade, or military force, we can continue to do so together successfully. That is actually quite a tall order, but I think, unlike some of us here, that the record of Europe working with the Obama administration has really not been so bad. A lot of good things have happened. And I think that that makes me reasonably optimistic for the future. Ian? I think from a national security point of view, and I work mostly in the political military realms, I think the biggest mistake of the Obama administration has been the president's conveying an impression that the United States is hesitant to use force, that U.S. policy is driven by the objective of avoiding the use of force. And at risk, I'm trying to not sound like a warmonger, but this administration and the next administration has to demonstrate more clearly the United States is willing to readily use force to defend its allies and partners without hesitation. That's going to be important. The second um, recommendation I have would be that the United States has to seriously restart resourcing strategic communications. We've been talking for over five years now about how we're losing the information war. We really haven't done anything. We haven't created any new organizational structures. We haven't really dedicated any serious amount of resources. NATO puts out some fact sheets. NATO puts out some fact (laughs) sheets and and has some of them. And NATO is not the role is not the institution for strategic communications. It never has been. That's an organization that's designed to put, throw lead down range, not write memos and, and do papers. You know, back during the Cold War, we had the United States Information Agency. That was a standalone organization whose director reported directly to the U.S. president. And it focused on nothing but the full gamut of strategic communications operations. Everything from, from press releases to TV to radio, student exchanges to joint research. They're still debating whether to even have that office in, in, inside NATO. It's, well, yeah, again, it's, it's, it's to me, it's irrelevant. NATO is not yeah. the role. This has to be a U.S. government 
priority, and it has to be given its own independent uh, department status and its own, uh, its, its own resource pool. Otherwise, we're going to be behind in that game. And this is where I think we're really uh, furthest behind when it comes down to dealing with our competitors, be it large states or terrorist organizations. Thanks. Well, that, in fact, was going to be our last wrap-up question, so thank you for posing it. And my apologies to Teresa Fallon, who I know back in Brussels, who wanted to talk a lot more about China. Sorry, Pat. Yeah. Um, thank you very much. You've all been a great audience, laughed at our jokes and things that weren't supposed to be funny, too. Um, so I appreciate it. It was, it was really a delight. And thank you to all the panelists. You guys were great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, and let me also just ask you to join in thanking Terry Schultz for keeping it very lively. And Thank you. Good luck braving the traffic, and have a very happy holiday.